as he says here, he's commanding all of us to a time of repentance. To know that when we come before God, we need to ask for forgiveness for the things that we're aware of and the things that we might have forgotten. To live a life of repentance, meaning every single day we know how important God is in our life and we know and understand that we need God in our life and that we need to come before him. And Lord, please forgive me where I fail because it's in my weakness that you are strong. That's the God that loves us. Now the Sunday Sermon with Lee Farmer, pastor of Cone Baptist Church, Heathsville, Virginia. Spend some time this morning in Acts chapter 17. As we start to think about what it means for us as believers and as Christians to have a call to truth. Now, let's just, let's talk. Nobody else is listening. It's just us, okay? Just us here in the room and a few people at home. What is truth? Because if you ask that question today in public, you're going to get a variety of answers. And it's amazing how there used to be a time in our society when you knew there were absolutes. You knew there was things that were right and things that were wrong. Well, now people are telling us, and I don't know who these people really are, but they're telling us that your truth may not be my truth. And that's interesting. Because there are some absolutes from God that are not negotiable. And so when we start to think about these truths and the thing that Paul is going to remind us or Scripture is going to remind us this morning as Paul is going to be preaching in this amazing place is that there are some things that are just not deniable. There are some things that we just can't flex on. And as believers, we understand that. And so today we're going to look at what Paul does as he's preaching. And he's preaching primarily to a Gentile audience. Now a little background about who he's talking to. These people have come from Greek and Roman tradition Their experiences have been with lots of different gods, with little g's. And they're coming out of this experience, and many of them are becoming to understand what it means to to worship the one true God. And so Paul's going to try to encourage them today about what it means and to remind them of the importance of following God and having a relationship with Him. And he wanted them more than everything to believe in God and to have that relationship. So join me, please, in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 22. Paul is in an amazing place at Aragopagus, a place that was used for public gatherings and for almost like a theater time or places where it took place where important meetings would happen or important concerts of the day would take place. And here he is. So Paul stood there in the meeting of Aragopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. So, you're ignorant of the very thing you worship. And that's what I'm going to proclaim to you. Here's what Paul's saying. As he walks into Athens and he begins to see all these incredible statues and idols of worship, he wants to remind them that these are not the things that you should worship. And he even realized that they were sort of covering their bases because maybe they couldn't remember every God's name. So, they, they just to be sure, they're going to say, hey, so we don't miss anybody? Let's run over here and put up a statue to whoever. We'll just say it's to the unknown God, and that way all of our bases are covered. And Paul's reminding them that that's not right. And what he wants to assure them of today is that there is a true God, and that we need to make sure we know who that true God is. Now, for us in society today, one of the things that we have to be so careful of is this. There are true God, or one true God that we worship, but how often in life do we have little gods that pop up? Little things in our life that we sort of unofficially worship or unofficially put above our relationship with God. Verse 24, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. So what he's saying to these folks that have built all these incredible altars to false gods is God doesn't dwell in these places. And God doesn't, and this is the one I love, you've heard me say this a lot, God doesn't need us. Sometimes that hurts, doesn't it? I tell my wife every day how much she needs me and she rolls her eyes in the back of her head. God doesn't need us, but he desires us. And he wants to have a relationship with us. 
And it's not about the altars and the the statues that were built. What he's saying is, look, God is not dwelling in these structures. God's dwelling in our presence. And he doesn't need our human hands, but he desires to have a relationship with us. And when we have this relationship with us, then Scripture says he gives us life, he gives us breath, and he gives us everything else. That's the God he wants them to understand. It's not in the structures or in the statues. The God that he wants them to understand can be in our presence and in our hearts through a personal relationship. So Paul is taking them back to the basics. And he's going to do so by going back to the creation of time, reminding them that this is the God that created everything. All the stars, all the planets that are all their places. This is the God who is desiring, the God of creation is desiring to have a relationship with you. Verse 26, For one man he made of all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Basically, he's laying a history lesson here, going all the way back to Adam and Eve. From the creation, he put in place man. And he put in place men for places for them to dwell in locations and countries and nations for them to dwell in. Places for them to serve God. And he recognizes that. He's sort of giving them the early organizational chart for you people who are in business. It starts here and it branches out to here. And this is all the things that God put into place. From the creation of human life to the location of where we are. And even to the struggles that we often face. Verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Though, and I love this part, he's not far from any of us. I don't know about you and your personal faith journey this morning. But have there ever been times in your life when you've wondered how far away God was? I have. Let's be honest this morning. Have there been struggles in your life and you've wondered where God was? And you wondered how far away he was? Paul says he's not that far. He's not that far from us. He reminds us of that. He reminds us that as the nation spread, as people spread, God was still in their presence. And God's mercy has been around us ever since the creation of human life. Verse 28. For in him we live and move and have being. And some of our own poets have said we are his offspring. What he's saying is some of our own Greek philosophers and our own Greek people have said even God is the God of God. Even the one true God is the one who created us for this purpose. And yes, we are his descendants. We are his offspring. And we find that through a relationship with him. Verse 29, since we are God's offspring, then we should not think that divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image that's made by human hands or human design and skill. Here's what he's saying. If you are a creation of God, if you are part of God's family, then you don't need the statues and the structures. What you need is God. What you need is that personal knowledge and that personal relationship with him because it's not found in the worship of idols or statues. It's not found in our modern day society in possessions or materialistic things. But that's a struggle for all of us sometimes because in our society, and I love America and I love what we stand for as a nation. I know we've got a lot of growing pains and I know we've got some issues we need to work on and I'm not denying that. But I'm patriotic, red, white, and blue all the way through. But I love God first. And I understand that that's where our devotion needs to be. And I know that we are a blessed nation and we should not forget it. But I don't want to worship the possessions that I have. I want to worship God who loves me. And has provided a way for me. And for you. Through the sacrificial life of his own son. Who willingly gave everything for us to have that opportunity. Verse 30, in the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but he commands all people everywhere to repent. Paul's saying here, you know, God's been patient with us as a people. And he's reminding them, these again, the Gentile people that he's talking to, that you were not included in the original outpouring. It was to the Jewish people, to the Jewish nation. God came into his own. Jesus came into his own. As we know and we studied last week, he is that cornerstone that they rejected. 
But the second phase of his plan was to allow us to be adopted in and grafted in through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And through that faith and trust, we get to be a part of God's plan. But as he says here, he's commanding all of us to a time of repentance. To know that when we come before God, we need to ask for forgiveness for the things that we're aware of and the things that we might have forgotten. To live a life of repentance, meaning every single day we know how important God is in our life and we know and understand that we need God in our life and that we need to come before him. And Lord, please forgive me where, where I fail because it's in my weakness that you are strong because that's the God that loves us. Verse 31 For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof to this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Jesus' life was living proof. His resurrection was factual proof of what God has in store for those of us who put our faith and trust in him. And Paul's reminding the people that were gathered that day, that as they push aside those idols and stop worshiping the false gods and the things of society that society tells us is more important and focuses on that one true God and that relationship, he says there's going to come a time when we have to stand before God. We have to come and stand before our judgment. But praise God, Jesus is going to be our intercessor. He's the one that's going to stand there before our Father in heaven and say, he or she is with me. If you love Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have the best attorney ever that will stand before you in the presence of the Almighty God on that day of judgment. For there will be a day that we have to stand and we have to answer for our sins, for those that we did and those we committed, or those sins of omission, those things that God called us to do that we didn't do. But if your relationship is in Jesus Christ, the price was paid on the cross of Calvary because he loves you so very much and desires to have that relationship with you. But the struggle that we have here today in 2023, Kim says, I get fascinated by shiny things. I don't know about you, but my attention can be diverted really quick. Oh, there's a squirrel, you know, kind of like that. And so society tells us that there are things out there that you're not complete and you're not whole unless you have these things. And there are places and things that you need to do that you're not a complete person if you don't do these things. But Paul reminds us today that our joy of salvation is what we need. And that comes in being complete in our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not in worshiping the things of this earth or the idols or the statues. Because they're going to crumble and they're going to fall. And you and I both know that. That brand new shiny car you bought, what's it going to look like in 10 or 15 years? Things crumble and fall, and they're destroyed. But the gift that God gives us is eternal, and it lasts forever. So our challenge today is to be sure that we're not placing idols in our path, that distract us from our worship from God. That we make sure that our relationship with Him is on point. And it's the first thing we think about. To be sure that we're not allowing possessions or materialistic things in our life to take us away from walking in the light that He's called us to walk in. To be sure that our relationship with Him is not all about the structure and the statue, but in the relationship that we have in Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. He has called us to truth today. And believers, we have that opportunity to walk in the light of Christ through proclaiming Him as our Lord and Savior. And my prayer for you today is that you've had that opportunity to call on Jesus, to believe in Jesus, and to know that your eternity is secure, and to know that you have the opportunity every single day that you live in this life, that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit is there with you to carry you in the good and the bad, the challenges of life and the glories and joys of our salvation. He desires you. Scripture said this morning, He doesn't need us, but He desires us because He loves us.
Would you bow your heads for just a moment, please? Paul preaching in this great historical place. We refer to it today in modern terminology as Mars Hill. It's proclaiming the word and the truth to a people who have been confused at times and often got distracted by the things around them. And what he wanted to remind them of today is that what's important is that you know God and the man that he sent to be the ruler over all, Jesus Christ. To be the one that we are allowed to be co-heirs in the kingdom with because he was the son of God. And to know that he is our redeemer because he paid the price for us on that cross. My prayer for you this morning is that you have found that call for truth in your life. And that we're doing everything that we can and and with his power to make sure that our life is in that proper order. And that we're not allowing the things of possessions and materialistic and false gods to get in our way of our relationship with him today. Here's the good news. God loves you. And wherever you are in your journey of faith, God's mercies and forgiveness are there for you to claim today. Don't leave this place today without knowing you're in the right place with your relationship with God. He loves you. His own son gave everything for you. And today, on this day of Mother's Day, when we celebrate the sacrifices of moms, we cannot forget the greatest sacrifice ever given, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. First things first, people, a call to truth. Oh, gracious and mighty God, thank you for the blessings of this day and the opportunity we have been given today to come and to worship. And my prayer is for us as we remind, are reminded today in Paul's words to make sure that we are worshiping and focusing on the one true God. And not allowing the distractions of life to interfere with our relationship with God. Lord, my prayer is this morning that someone here today or someone listening to the sound of my voice has never opened their heart to you and never put their faith and trust in you. That today, before we leave this place, they will simply pray, Lord, I need you in my life. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. And then we know the work of discipleship begins. Or gracious God, maybe those of us who've been on this journey of faith for a while just needed a fresh reminder to get again excited about our faith and what you do in our life each and every day and to know how truly blessed we are because of what you've done for us. God, thank you for that blessing today. Now guide us in this hymn of invitation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You've just heard the Sunday Sermon with Lee Farmer, pastor of Cone Baptist Church, Heathsville, Virginia, online at conebaptist.com. That's C-O-A-N-Baptist.com.